You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. You may find all your sales and rental equipment needs at McAllister.com. We are pleased to announce our podcast is a member of the All Indiana Podcast Network in partnership with Wish TV. You may find Leaders and Legends at AllIndianaPodcastNetwork.com. Thinking of starting a podcast or need to host a public meeting? Let Leaders and Legends LLC be your partner as you look for new ways to communicate your message. Please contact Chris Spangle or me at leadersandlegends.net. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is Michael Huber. Michael serves as the Indy Chamber President and CEO. He was a former Deputy Mayor under Greg Ballard. He worked for Mayor Steve Goldsmith. He did business deals at the Indianapolis International Airport, and he as much as anyone I've ever worked with helped me personally in the guidance I needed more than once. Michael, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Robert, thanks for having me on. It's always good to see you. I, I don't, I'm a loyal listener of leaders and legends, as you know, and I don't, I don't feel like I've achieved the status yet, but you know, I'm like, Maybe if I maybe if we talk about this stuff today, maybe in twenty years I will I will have gotten to you know where some of your other guests have gotten. So I, I'm just along for the ride. Well, we have first off, all of us pale in comparison to Chris Spangle, who is the engineer for the Leaders and Legends podcast. So if that's the standard, then we're all in trouble. Uh, secondly, you have such a terrific resume, which we're going to dive deeply into, and such a Renaissance man, a talented musician wonderful family man everything you do i'm very honored to have you on it's actually been um, a long time coming uh, with covid and everything else so thank you very much and i should say that i'm returning the favor because i'm appearing on your podcast which should be posted pretty soon it is yep episode 21 of michael loves indy i'll talk you know before we hang up i'll talk more about that but yeah we had a great conversation i'm definitely going to have you back so yeah looking forward to today you are not a native born Hoosier, if memory serves. You are from Illinois, is that correct? Yeah, I'm from um, a small town an hour south of Springfield, Illinois, an hour northeast of St. Louis, Missouri, called Hillsboro, where several generations of my dad's family, uh, Germans, um, hailed and since the 1800s. And my mom is from Oakland, California. And as you know, my so by some weird coincidence, my mom and my wife are both from Oakland, California. So I've got this in, in addition to growing up in my small town, I've got this great affinity. Uh, it's my second home is definitely Oakland. So what, what would Freud say, Michael? <laughs> right. right. When did your family come over? Did it come over like in the 1870s, 1880s from Germany? Yeah, that's about the right time frame. Yeah, because that's, and, that's yep. Bismarck's culture comp where he. That's, where he, that's right. The Hubers and the the Spinners and and they um, I have I have a relative who owned most of the land that's now Mammoth Cave. His last name is Simon, but he sold the land before uh, the caves were discovered. <laughs> so that's that's a t- <laughs> that's a story that a lot of my my family likes to tell. And came up came up through Kentucky to uh, to uh, Illinois where I grew up. So a reverse Jed Clampett. Exactly. <laughs> Right. How did you end up here? I know you went your undergrad. Now we respectfully call it Nerd Western. Right. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Amos. Thank you, John Murray. Thank you, Michael Huber and others. You yep. went to Northwestern University in Chicago uh, for your undergrad. How did I you did. end up here in Indianapolis? Yeah. So um, most of my family, a lot of my family members went to Illinois in Champaign Urbana, which is a great school, and I got to go to Northwestern. Um, 
in the late nineties, got a job out in the DC area. Before that I had, um, interned for Senator Dick Durbin, Senator Richard J. Durbin, if you know him, yes. one year out in DC. And I, I, I realized that I, I had thought I had wanted to work on Capitol Hill. I realized that I liked public service, but I, that wasn't really my main interest. And so I ended up working for a consulting firm uh, at the time they were called American Management Systems in, in Northern Virginia. And I worked in their group that specialized in state and local government solutions. And I just, even at that time, I liked the idea of how do you, how can you solve public problems that are close to people? So I, um, when I was, I had been out in DC about two and a half years and got the opportunity via Steve Goldsmith, who actually at that time was former mayor. I moved, he was involved in a, a, a company called NetGov. It was a tech company. They had a consulting arm uh, called uh, Competitive Government Solutions and or Competitive Government Strategies. And I moved to Indianapolis just because it was closer to home. I, the, the opportunity to work around uh, Steve Goldsmith and some of his colleagues was really attractive. And I loved Indianapolis from the minute I got here in uh, 2001. So you, did you meet Goldsmith in DC? He, he, he stopped being governor, or excuse me, mayor in 2000 as a result of the 99 election. When did you meet uh, former mayor Goldsmith? Yep. I met him in 2001. So I moved here that the principles of the firm that I came to work for included, um, Skip Stitt, deputy mayor of Indianapolis in the 1990s. Mike Brink, who is a very talented uh, leader in Goldsmith's administration in the 1990s. One of the young consultants was now Judge David Serto. So I had the office next to him and I even lived in uh, Judge Serto's house for the first nine months when I moved to Indianapolis before either of us was married, obviously. And uh, I met Steve Goldsmith in that time in 2001. And the thing that I feel like I got pretty lucky because I had just turned 25. I moved to Indianapolis and it's not, you know, DC is such a massive network of people, you know, and, and that's, that's the way it's set up. But um, in Indianapolis, I had the good fortune of meeting people like Steve Goldsmith, whose network introduced me very quickly to a lot of, you know, both Republicans and Democrats throughout the city. So I had this, I, I, I got really lucky. I had this great experience of an Indianapolis that was pretty well connected and I got to meet a lot of people. We really enjoy it on the Leaders and Legends podcast when we learn something new. So I had no idea after all our years of friendship and all my years of friendship with Judge David Serto, former podcast guest of ours, that you two lived together. We did. Was that before he moved to the Near East Side or? No, nope. that was that was in his that was in his house. Um, he and there were like four or five of us rooming at different times, kind of a rotating cast. And he, he, his, he was dating his now wife, Megan, um, who was, they were doing the long distance thing. And she, she would visit uh, Indianapolis from time to time before they got engaged. And she called it the Serto home for wayward boys. So that's like a running joke. <laughs> that we, yeah. so, so it was not, I, I would, you know, we, I think um, it was not, people always ask me, it was not one of those animal house experiences. I wish I had all these stories of wild parties and things like that. I really, I really don't, you know, judge Serto is, is a great guy. And, um, but it was, it was a very welcoming environment when I got to Indianapolis and, and uh, Dave Serto now judge Serto was, was great. Did you have to be Catholic to live there? (laughs) I think we all were actually, (laughs) I really think about it. I'm pretty sure we all were just by affinity or something. Yeah. But so what, yeah, that's in Woodruff place on the, on the near East side of Indianapolis. Yep. You received your MBA from the Kelly school of business. What made you decide to pursue an advanced degree? Yeah, it it was certainly the influence of Skip Stitt and Mike Brink and and Steve Goldsmith. There's no question because I had studied, uh, you know, social policy, public policy. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew I liked public service, but I, I realized quickly that I needed to get my business analytical skills and, and really work on those that I, I, I didn't really have a lot of great financial knowledge or things like that. So I was one of those people that I, I got into business school in Bloomington. I lived there for about 15 months, but was still working uh, on some consulting projects in Indianapolis. But this was pure, I was purely going to business school just to try to upgrade my skills because I knew that I needed to get better in just general business skills. And it was a great environment for that. Um, the, the Kelly School of Business is great. I met my wife there, Helen, uh, who's from California. And 
not long after going to business school, I started volunteering on the Mitch Daniels campaign for governor and then uh, ended up getting hired before I completed my MBA at the beginning of the Mitch Daniels administration. You and I met a couple times way, way back, uh, back then. You were, you were if, I, if I recall, you were working for um, the uh, county clerk, Doris uh, Ann Sadler. Sadler. I remember that. And uh, yeah, and so I, I, I was very, I was very fortunate. Again, it's not a big state. I met Mitch Daniels through the Steve Goldsmith network. And through a, for a time in my life, over a year, I'd be driving back and forth between Indianapolis and Bloomington literally every day, but it was a great time. Did you ever consider getting a law degree or getting your PhD? I know how much education, I know how, how important it is. I, how, I guess, I guess I'm going to say it this way. I know how much you get off on learning more yeah. things and newer things, but is the MBA like, okay, this is my validator. I don't need anything else. Yeah. It's a combination of um, my parents. So I, I grew up, I'm the oldest of four boys. Dad is a Navy veteran. My, I lost my dad and he died of cancer in 2008. And it's one of my great regrets, Robert, you and my dad just would have sat for hours and hours and hours because you guys have so many shared interests. It's just, you know, unbelievable. Even though I'm Army and he's Navy. Right. And, my, and I have three, three younger brothers who are, who are all, uh, who were Naval officers now. Uh, but and now they're now they're all out. But so the Navy influence in my family ran deep. And my father was also a small town lawyer. And I think my it's not that my dad discouraged me to go to law school, but he I think he really wished that he had gotten more engineering or more business. And I'm sure I was influenced by that. The reality is, and, I, and I, I've made peace with this now, my orientation is really that of an operator um, and kind of a generalist. And I was always a B, B plus student in college and in graduate school. And I, I used to think that I was lazy and not applying myself. The reality is I had so many interests and I had a tendency just to take on too much at any one time because I had so many interests. And so the MBA, I think, was a really good thing for me. I, the, re, the reality is I get inspired by the academics and things like that. But especially when I was in my 20s, it wasn't part of my nature to just get to to the kind of discipline and depth that you would have to have to pursue a PhD and, and probably a law degree. You're thought of, you're very well thought of. And when people mention you, they, they say words like smart and hip, and that's a tough combination, but you somehow managed to pull it off. What is it? How important is it for you to be thought of as someone who is, collaborative intellectually someone who is easy to work with i mean we worked on some big projects together when we were in the bowed administration but you, i would and i'd say this as a compliment that when you when you are attached to something it does bring a certain intellectual credibility to it that must make you feel good a but b how important is it for you to take that approach where hey look let's get a bunch of smart people and not just book smart, but smart people together and let's figure out this problem. Yeah. It's, I mean, you, you you flatter me because you know, some, some of it's a false humility. I'm sure, you know, I, I, I have, I have an ego and I have a, I have a, I have a genuine desire, you know, for validation and things like that. But you know, that being said, I, I feel really lucky because certainly Steve Goldsmith and Skip Stitt and Mike Brink and people like that, certainly a lot of people that I worked with in the Ballard administration, yourself included, there were, there were a lot of people who modeled a certain behavior. And um, uh, it's like, I noticed that if you're a good, really good team player, and if you follow through on your commitments, then you can move up very, very fast in public service. And, um, I, uh, uh, and, and also display a certain level of intellectual curiosity because, you know, in, in politics, Robert, it does attract a certain amount of people who don't like to be wrong. You know, they like to be right and they don't like to be seen as wrong. And so it, if, and I kind of, so I kind of, I had some colleagues who sort of modeled behaviors also of what not to do. Okay. So like, don't act like, you know, something you don't know, always ask the question. Don't be so insecure to ask the question. And because it was, so it's almost like 
I was very fortunate in my 20s to have a number of people who said, like Steve Goldsmith, what, what do I think of when I think of Steve Goldsmith? I think of always be guided by that curiosity and that curiosity will lead you in the right direction. You know, um, always be collaborative and let it be about the team because I noticed that the people who took too much credit, those weren't the people who got to be recruited to the better teams. The people who would do the work and help share the credit among, you know, those were the people who got the opportunities. And so I saw enough of that, that I kind of was able to, to navigate it and then, and then figure that out. And then I also figured out that you don't always have to have the solution. In fact, there's, there are a lot of times when, um, if you're the one who can bring the subject matter experts in the room and get them, uh, collaborating on a solution, a lot of times that's the skill set that's missing. I don't know if that answered your question. Well, it, it does because you know we we all like to think of ourselves as as intelligent people and and egos do get in the way sometimes for all of us but it's always it seems to me to be instructive to sit back every once in a while in these meetings where you're dealing with you know for example the utility transaction that we did that was what 2 billion dollars and so we're not going to have all the answers so how about let's listen to Nate Feltman talk about the best way to do things, or let's listen to Mark Miles talk about, Hey, this is what yep. I think you should do. Uh, we did the, we had a committee together and we had uh, professor Bill Bloomquist from IUPUI whose, whose intelligence is just, it's simply remarkable. But one of the things, and we'll get to mayor Ballard here in a second, but one of the things that I thought that mayor Ballard did really well was to convene this group of thinkers and, 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 not just the people I mentioned, but others as well. Mayor Goldsmith was around and, and being helpful. So how, how important is it for you personally, and also as CEO of the Indy Chamber, to be surrounded by people who are just pretty darn smart? So it's everything, honestly. I mean, that's, that's, being being in an environment where there's constant ideas and people are talking about the possibilities for me and i i think that just my my personality type my orientation i mean that is that is everything right and so i figured out somewhere in the experience somewhere between working for daniels and working for ballard that especially in a city like indianapolis there are men and women who feel so invested in in who may, and maybe they've moved on robert maybe they're retired you know and if you're the per if you're the person who can create an in for them, especially with a new mayor in terms of like Ballard, you know, we you and I and you know Chris Cotterell and Paul Okeson and Ryan Vaughn and like we were very intentional about hey let's go back let's find as many of the alums of of you know Peterson and Goldsmith and Hudnut as as possible and see if we can give them a stake in what we're doing and if I figured out that if you can, if you can do that, not only does it help you build relationships, but the range of ideas that you get to have just, you know, um, uh, circulating around the room is so much broader. You know what I'm saying? And we should mention, uh, in, in that list and, the, and there are several, obviously, but uh, someone else who we worked with, who's, who's incredibly, has a force of nature intellectually, and that was former public safety director and Marion County prosecutor Scott Newman. Absolutely, David Wu. There's a lot, yeah, it's it's a a lot, uh, and and so, but what you describe, and I'm glad I I don't think anybody's asked me this before that that environment where you've got these different ideas and perspectives of the possible circulating around the room is everything. Okay, now the politics has to has to factor in when you're talking about elected office. And I had a low amount of patience for the politics when I was younger, but I started realizing that to do big things, if I would regard the politics as a tool, as a necessary tool to get support for trying to do big things, then I could understand it and try to interact with it and reach out to people like you in terms of how we, how you, how you handle it. So if I, when I started, when I stopped looking at politics as, oh, this is kind of a, a dirty part of the business and I, I don't feel completely comfortable with this, but more about no, how do you, how do you build support for this big mixed use real estate thing you want to do? You know what I mean? Or this, you know, utility transaction that you want to do. 
and build real relationships, that's when I started to be less um, intimidated by the politics. Can't do anything unless you win. That's right. That's right. What was it like? You mentioned you worked for a little while for the Mitch Daniels administration. Uh, what was that like? Speaking of a collection of really smart people. Yeah, the the um, the the environment was the most exciting thing. So the, the state had had, uh, you know, 16 years of Democrat rule. Mitch Daniels runs for governor and he had recruited. So I, at the time I came into the Mitch Daniels administration, I was, uh, I don't know, 28, something like that. And he, he had recruited a lot of people of that of that age uh, to come in, many of whom left their jobs or had come out of graduate school or things like that. Ryan Kitchell, who went on to be Mitch's uh, budget director and head of OMB, and then the, the chief financial officer at IU Health, uh, personally recruited me. I was also recruited by Senator Todd Young on the campaign. Actually, the first guy who called me to work <laughs> on the campaign was Todd Young, um, and I've never let him forget that. Uh, Todd actually did not go into the administration full time that we, we really wanted him to, but he's obviously gone on to, to great things. Um, but there, there was a group and you, you know, cause you were there, I don't know, 50 people, uh, all pretty young who supported each other and have, have continued to, uh, to support each other. And it, it was really, it was the environment meeting a lot of people, um, and, you know, looking back, it also wasn't a very, like, ideologically Republican environment either. It was more people who were really passionate about public service. Uh, and that stands out. Election night 2007. Do you remember where you were when you learned that Greg Ballard was going to be the next mayor of the city of Indianapolis? Yep. I was at whatever the place is called, uh, Dorman Street Pub or May's Lounge or whatever, meeting a friend for drinks. And that feels like forever because, as you know, I don't drink anymore for the last like almost five years. And so and then I got I got texts. Yeah, I got you inspired me, uh, among others. But I got texts from Tom John, our friend saying, hey, Ballard is going to win. Come on over. And I said, you know, I don't feel quite right. I really didn't help him. So. Um, I drove home and I, I was like, wow, woke up the next morning. How soon after uh, Ballard's victory after election day uh, were you approached about coming to work for the administration? About a week. And it was uh, David and Ann Shane, um, who are like family to me, uh, Joe Loftus, uh, Melissa Prophet, and um, uh, oh, and at the time, it's not that I wasn't interested. I'd only been with the Daniels administration for three years and uh, Ballard did one. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, they, they were, as you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, kind of the former Goldsmith people and Luger people were uh, working with Ballard, helping him build a team. And I ended up uh, talking to him maybe right after, right after Thanksgiving, had about an hour long conversation with them and uh, yeah, it changed my life. Yeah. What about Greg Ballard, his personality and, and sort of his 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 stand on the issues and what he wanted to do for the city? What made it what made him attractive to go work for in your mind? Well, at first, his um, his lack of um, his lack of a filter and his lack of ego kind of presence threw me off. It was not at all what I expected you know it was just like having a conversation with a with a family member and that that threw me off and i i look back and i was like the the hubris that it took i basically came in and i said i you know i'm only interested in this job there's so much potential in the city and to 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 um do these kinds of deals you know i was thinking about you know ways to um raise more capital for infrastructure. And I was thinking about big real estate transactions and things like that. And I said, I'm only interested if, if, um, if you'll let me do these things, which I can't believe I said that. And he kind of, he listened and he kind of asked me some questions and, um, and he, he never lets me forget this. And so at the end of the conversation, allegedly I said, so really, are you sure you would let me do all this? And he said, yeah, if you work with colleagues and try to get people on board. Yeah, absolutely. And I couldn't believe it. Well, as he had said in the administration that, and we were just a few years, Ballard wins in November of seven. I think it was 
was it late 2006, early 2007 that, and we had the governor, uh, we had governor Daniels on the podcast a couple of times. The second time he talked about this, the toll road deal was announced, uh, that the state got, I think, three point eight billion or something like that. Yep. I'm pretty close. And Greg Ballard wanted you to find him his toll road. Deal. He said, "He said, find me Indianapolis's toll road deal uh, that um, regularly in the first year. Gave me a lot of time, and you were there. I mean, a lot of time for exploration. You know, if I'd had a, and this is one thing that's so great about Ballard. If it had been a three month timeline." And, you know, it never would, never would have worked. You know, he gave me, he gave me a ton of trust to do that kind of exploration and um, uh, put a team together and do the kind of analysis. And yeah, incredibly grateful for that. But so when he says, find me my tow road deal, did you have a frame of reference? Did you have any idea about, I knew what you, we obviously knew what I he did. meant. Yep. But it's getting it's getting to the destination. Yeah. So, um, I knew that the I knew that I knew where we wanted to get, which was um, take basically squeeze the efficiencies out of city assets and um, to create an infrastructure fund to help build the city's infrastructure and and fund other long term. Uh, needs and to do that within the constraints that we were given, which were pretty significant. You know, the the uh, budget constraints. Ballard, of course, was elected in part because of the uh, uh, property taxes being reassessed, and then he we, he came in the full effect of the property tax caps we were experiencing, and so um, we were we were trying to find how can we have better, more efficient use of assets, but also identify savings that we can um, that we could set aside in a very large fund for infrastructure. So we always knew that was where we wanted to go. We knew that there were great possibilities on uh, water and wastewater. I would be remiss if I didn't mention David Sherman, brilliant engineer who helped us identify the possibilities on wastewater and water. And David and I would argue all the time, but I always felt like it was respectful. You know what I mean? We would argue about the approach, but I, but we always, and I, and I learned so much from David Sherman. So he's incredibly knowledgeable for he sure. He is. He is. And, and so we always knew, we always knew where we wanted to get, and it was Ballard giving me that opportunity to do the analysis of the city's water and wastewater utilities, the parking meters, you know, other assets. And, um, yeah, it was it was an incredibly exciting time. You mentioned a few minutes ago about um, working in the office of Dick Durbin, a Democrat from Illinois. Um, when I have people on the podcast who have a political background or political interest, I I ask this question, and I meant to ask it earlier, so I'm going to go back to it. Uh, who or what or how? did your political philosophy and political sort of affiliation get shaped? Dick Durbin's a Democrat. You're obviously a Republican who's worked for Republican administrations. So was there a, was there a gradual shift or you just took a gig because it was in DC and you were always of a certain philosophy? Cause I know your dad shaped it considerably huge. for you. Yeah. My, my dad, my dad, it was huge. So my family in Illinois, my dad's side of the family, largely, John F. Kennedy Democrats. My dad was a Barry Goldwater Republican. My dad, and, and you're very familiar with this photo because I had it in my office, my dad um, uh, ran and narrowly lost in 1980 for state's attorney in Illinois, which is the equivalent of county prosecutor in our, in our county. And I've got this great photo of my dad with Ronald Reagan, Reagan and Bush on their tour in the, in the 1980 presidential campaign stopped at the county fair outside my town in Butler, Illinois, mm. population 250. And my dad <laughs> got, my dad got photographed with Reagan and Bush. And I've got this great photo of Reagan and my dad and Reagan. Allegedly, my dad says to Reagan, uh, so this is my father who went to St. Louis University first from his family to go to college, naval officer in Vietnam, law school in San, University of San Francisco, USF, which is where he met my mom. And, and my mom moved with my dad back to Illinois. So my dad had lived in California for some time. And my dad meets Ronald Reagan when my dad is running for state's attorney and is standing next to Reagan and says, Governor, I need you to know 
you're the reason I'm a Republican, but I've only been a Republican since 1972, to which Reagan allegedly says, <laughs> that's okay. I've only been a Republican since 1964. So, so my father definitely impacted me in that regard. I am of the belief, Robert, the sincere belief that my father would have turned independent today, okay, in the last five or six years. And I really, I really believe that. But as I look back, he allowed me to kind of take on different ideologies as I was growing up, you know, and there I'd go through certain things where I would swing, I think, more toward the Democrat Party. And then I'd go through things where I'd swing more toward the Republican Party. And that's also why I think I've adopted a view that people typically, yeah, you know, who you are is not going to change that much and who I am is not going to change that much. And yet, you know, we go through things that, that our philosophies can change. The political parties themselves are moving targets, right? And, the, and they shift from time to time. And I think if anything, so my father was definitely the most, the most in, impactful person, but he also was very understanding as I and my brothers and other people would kind of go, you almost, almost let you put on different ideologies. And um, I think that's so important because as I look at somebody like Steve Goldsmith, okay, he, he just, he's guided by his curiosity and he writes a new book every two to three years. So if you're, to, if you were to recalibrate where Steve is on the issues that changes every five or 10 years. Um, and I really, I really admire that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I sincerely hope that if you were you and I were having this conversation in 10 years, that you'd be in a different place based on things you had gone through and that I would too. You know what I mean? Sure. There, there are certain aspects. You, some of them are internal and some of them are external where you change your mind on issues. Some yeah. are macro, some are micro. I'm, yeah. I'm against the death penalty. I used to be, you know, basically the governor of Florida trying to light people up every other day. Uh, but when you, when you start to, I'm against the death penalty, even though people clearly deserve it. Yeah. And it's mostly as it relates to the innocence, the potential innocence, innocence. Yeah. And, and it's probably less likely now with DNA yeah. evidence, but the legion of stories of people who were put to death and clearly were innocent or had faulty counsel or, or were, you know, quite frankly, immersed in a system where their race was used against them. The list goes on and on. And you can, you can come up with other, other avenues of thought, but yes, you should examine your own views from time to time, yeah. not only intellectually, but emotionally, just to make sure they don't become stale because we don't, none of us want to be iconoclasts. And, and, you know, it's like Ryan Vaughn will make fun of me from time to time saying he'll, he'll, he'll turn to me and say, we'll be talking about something and say, well, Michael, could you offer up the Democrat perspective on this issue? And it's like, <laughs> and then, but the reality is like, I've changed since Ryan and I started working together and Ryan has too, right? I could tell you, I, I could tell you stories about how he, he sees things differently now. And uh, you know, it's like, and it's, all, all it's done, Robert, is just reinforced in me a belief that, okay, just because someone is is on this issue or this is where they are now, you can't assume that's where they're going to be in three years, you know? You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends, LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today is Michael Huber, former Deputy Mayor for Greg Ballard. He serves as the President and CEO of the Indy Chamber. Uh, Michael, is there a particular Hoosier leader and or legend you admire? You know, um, I'm going to go with lately. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about John Mutz. That was the first name that came to mind, you know, think about, and I think about people that, um, that have. His impact is, com is incredibly underrated. Multi, multifunctional, you know, he's done, he can, he's done a lot of different things. He served the public philanthropic private sectors. So that I just went with the first name that came to mind, Robert. Um, and, uh. I'm trying to think he's, he's, that, he's, he, he's, he's the first person that comes to mind. The reality is, and this is why I enjoy listening to leaders and legends so much. There's a whole network of kind of the fathers and mothers of the city, 
that have been, um, you know, I don't want to say custodians because custodians almost makes it makes it sound like they've been standing watch. It's not really that they've been driving Indianapolis. Catalyst. Uh, yeah, totally. You know, for the last 40 or 50 years, you know, I, I, I got in a debate with somebody one time, they were being critical of Indianapolis. And I was basically like, look, go back to the 1950s. And there's no real advantages that Indianapolis has over Springfield, Illinois, which is close to where I'm from. Okay. Today, there's no comparison. Indianapolis is more like Nashville, Tennessee, you know, or Denver. And not because of pure natural advantages either. It's literally because of people and the kind of leaders that you, you know, the appetite for taking risk and it's all the people that you interview on the show. Well, I appreciate that. And, and that's a terrifically articulated point. I'd never really thought of that comparison. They're both capitals of their state. They're both centrally located. I mean, Springfield does have Lincoln, Lincoln's body in the house and he's got a, the Lincoln Museum. And so there's some a natural tourism uh, attractions there, but whether it's John Mutz or Louis Mayhern or David Frick, the list goes on. I mean, we, we did this, we could do this all day. We, we did it. We kind of did it with Fred glass when we had him on the podcast where we started trying to list all the names and you just simply couldn't do it. But a big part that came out and it's something I've tried to highlight on the podcast is it's been bipartisan. Yes. Most yep. of the time the council has been Republican. Yes. Most of the time or majority of the time, the mayors have been Republican, but it is, completely and totally a bipartisan effort to get where we are in 2021 from where we started. And we kind of started at 1967 when Luger wins his yep. first term as Indianapolis mayor as CEO of the Indy chamber, bipartisanship or nonpartisanship would seem to be crucial to your mission. How do you pull that off for lack of a better term in these very political times? It, it, articulating the higher purpose and sometimes that's a moving target so but always make sure that you're articulating that higher purpose and that's it's just it's just so so important it's it's um trying trying to articulate where we're going you know as a city and then more recently as a as a region and um so i have to can i take it back for a second because i thought i thought of something so so and this is all relative real related to your question. So one of the things that you made me think of with Ballard, I came in um, for, for three years, my job was mainly transactions. So you and I worked on the water and wastewater transaction together, the parking meters, modernizing the parking meters, you know, over a billion dollars of urban infill development that Ballard allowed me to work on. Right. And it's like, so, so I was, I was, I guess, in some ways people said, Oh, Huber's Ballard's deal guy. And I, and I kind of, and I let that identity kind of happen. I, and some of that I liked, but I, I think that, um, I trans, what does a transaction do? Like you'd never want to go into a government uh, environment and just start doing deals just to do them. That's, that's not a, that, that it's not right. Um, but a transaction, what does that give you? It gives you a deadline to focus resources and then it gives you an event to do things differently. And I started to figure out that if you, you could use a transaction or an event to sort of shock people and try to get them to think differently and then impose a deadline that gets, you know, on the government side that gets people to, to have intense focus, myself included. And I kind of figured out that, um, you could take that transactional approach to a lot of different things. You know, you know what I mean? Like you could take it to um, an abandoned site, you know, like, cause you and I worked on like the teardown of Wishard, uh, not wish of uh, Winona, the old Winona hospital, right. Which became the family sports experience for the children's museum. You know, you and I both worked on Bush stadium, you know, reimagining that, that historic ballpark as a mixed use development with public space and things like that. And so, somewhere I'm trying to bridge the work that I was doing for the mayor somewhere along the line that kind of clued me into, Oh, maybe you could apply this type of thinking to something like a chamber organization, you know, an economic development organization. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And one of the things that you do when you're in the mayor's office, and I'm assuming the governor's office as well is you're, you're forever linked to a, to a leader and you're, you're sort of forever linked to, 
projects or impact. Uh, for me, it's the Irvington Charter High School and the old Guardian's home, which is right across the street from where I grew up. I mean, that would be the one thing that I would say that, that I, if someone said, give me something where you made something happened or started the ball rolling, that would be it with all credit to going to Curry Garage, obviously, and the folks who actually made that school happen. But that's the one thing that I particularly can point to. But with what, but I worked in communication. So I basically just kind of talked about what other people did. You did some of these things. And one of the things that you spearheaded, helped make happen, led the effort for was the parking meter deal. So I'm going to choose that one thing before we move on. So the parking meters were antiquated. You had to use coins. There wasn't a lot of turnover. We, the city itself was involved in, in the, in the world of parking meters. It, it's utterly ridiculous. Greg Ballard said the hell with all that. And now we have the system that we have that is currently throwing off millions more dollars than it yep. was before the Hogshead administration just extended the deal, which had to make you feel good. But there was a newspaper article about the deal and I had to, you know, represent the Ballard administration. It's one of those things where it's like you're forever linked with this guy, no matter what, no matter how many years it's been since he was the mayor, you're still linked. You're still a part of it. You're still part of that family and the public and media perception. How do you feel about that fact? And when you use the parking meters, you use the app or the credit card or whatever, do you think, you know, I kind of made this happen. Yeah, it, it's, it's great. You know, and, and I wish when, when people, some people will give me, um, start to give me grief about the parking meter deal. And I say, I wish I had been able to replicate that 10 times over with other asset classes. Cause I just, I think I, and I, and I'm, I, I will die on that hill. The parking meter, the truth, <laughs> the truth, the truth is, the truth is, um, you know, there's a, there is a way there, there are ways that the city can renegotiate that. And Hogsett knows that I'm available to him and there, there are ways that we could renegotiate it. So um, I am proud of it because it took a, an asset that had, you know, the, the, the rates hadn't been increased since the, since the year I was born in 1975. Um, and it was um, not throwing off any revenue. And we did so many, again, transaction, we did so many different things. We were able to modernize the technology and the meters, but have the vendor pay for that cost. We we're able to generate a lot of money, which ended up going to uh, Georgia Street downtown in advance of the Super Bowl, and then also to uh, uh, Broad Ripple to make infrastructure improvements in Broad Ripple. And we were able to shift a lot of the risk. See, that's the, in the quote, privatization debate, which the privatization isn't the right term. You, it should really be about shared risk. So what risk does the government entity assume? And then what risk do they agree to shift to the uh, private operator. And um, people make a lot of the 50 year term of the deal. The fact is there's a way that the city can buy it out every 10 years. It's not a secret. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's and definitely- that's what the Hogshead administration just had. They, cho they chose to extend it, right? And it's definitely doable. It was funny, you know, and I get it. You know, people got really some, there was significant opposition to it and I totally understood it. And um, there's so many, so many, that project has so many spinoff stories, which we won't get into now, but among them, um, look, the, the practice of going out into the community, both on the water and wastewater uh, sale to Citizens Energy and on the parking meter deal, and just meeting skepticism and just getting my butt kicked in public forums, Robert, <laughs> looking back was really good experience, you know, the kind of prep um, going up against the the going to the city county council and just being ready to answer their questions respectfully and not lose your nerve was great practice for me mm -hmm. one of my favorite ones is so uh, I'll, I'll try to make this story quick so at the time my favorite urban blogger who at the time is based in chicago aaron wren the urbanophile who I, who I read religiously one day i wake up and he's writing a post about how bad the indie parking meter proposal, which had not gotten passed by the council, how bad he believes it is. And I take it into your office. You and I are both working for the mayor at the time. I take it into your office in a panic. And you said, well, and I say, Robert, the Urbana file has written this total takedown of the parking meter. This is a disaster. And you're like, well, is he right? And I kind of pause and I'm like, well, well, yeah, he makes some good points, but then he makes some other points that are just wrong. And you're like, 
okay, what are you doing tomorrow? It was a Saturday. All right, let's put something together. And we line by line, 13 pages. We caught, if you include his, his criticisms and then our responses, 13 pages, we send it to him. I've never communicated with him before at this point. We send it to the Urbano file and he posts it. And he is then, Aaron Wren is then brought in by the Democrats to testify against the proposal. All right. That sparks a 10 year friendship that I have with Aaron Wren resulting in a year ago, me hiring Aaron Wren to come work for the Indy chamber for a year and write for us and bring him and his wife and young son back to Indianapolis where he is. And he and I communicate all the time now. So I know that's like, that's like five different stories in one, <laughs> but you know, it's like the, a, a, a younger version of me would have basically said, well, forget that guy. I don't, I don't want that guy. You know, that, I, you know, that, that guy's against me. I don't want that guy in my life, but actually even though we were pitted on opposite sides of the issue, I had profound respect for his work uh, ends up sparking this, you know, great friendship. And the cool thing about Indianapolis, as you know, from your leaders and legends podcast is it's just full of stories like that. You know, a great way to, to get smarter is to talk to people who are smarter. Well, and you, and I, I got to tell you, I've been told you this before. So you changed my life in a couple of different ways, but I've, I, I've never, I've never told you this before. So I was super nervous um, one night, and I think I'm pretty sure it was, a, we were proposing, we were having in a council hearing on the parking meter deal. And I was, I just wasn't, I don't know. I was tired. I just wasn't feeling it with public hearing after public hearing after public hearing, which looking back was great experience, but I did not feel that way at the time. And I was like, I don't know, R Robert, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I was not feeling great about going into this hearing, which I knew was going to be very, uh, contentious for opponents of the deal. And you basically said, you said to me, and I, you sent in a text, you said, you said, there's nobody better articulating the intersection of commerce, community, and culture than you. So just, just go out there and share the vision. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I mean, I was, I was like, I was like, I mean, that, that was like, that was what I needed to hear, but I had never, I had never heard anybody say that to me. You know what I mean? And it was more, so instead of, instead of like being like, nope, you go in there and just give them all the right answers. You were like, you were like, no, nah, man, you, you've got, you've got a unique point of view on these things and you don't need to be, you, you don't need to be nervous about that. That changed my life. I'm not exaggerating. Well, that's very, very kind. That's very kind, Michael. And I do remember another quick story where uh, the Indianapolis business journal and it's a uh, very bright, a very persistent reporter, Corey Shouten was uh, not a fan of the deal. And we sat with him, I think at Cups in downtown Indianapolis. And we walked in and he's like, you know, are you sure it's a good idea? And I just said, does anyone know more about this deal than you? Does anyone know more about the benefits of this deal than you? Can anyone articulate it better than you? And you went, no. And I said, well, then go in there and kick the living hell out of Corey Shouten. He's incredibly bright, but he's got a point of view, but so do we. Don't be afraid to take him on. Let's engage. I said, argue with him. I'll be there. Fight with him. And we fought with him for an hour, and it was a great time. Like, it wasn't yeah. a vicious fight. It was a contentious discussion. But that's one of the things that I, that that you're so good at. I mean, and you mentioned Ryan Vaughn. You mentioned Chris Cotterell. I mean, Paul Okeson. The list goes on and on. Jen Pittman, where you just have – like, let's go argue with these folks because I think their intentions are pure. They may be laced with a little bit of politics, yep. but, but we can't get the mayor where he needs to be by covering up, you know, we got to go out and draw fire. And that's, that's one right. of the things you did very well. And Corey, you know, shout out to Corey, who I know is in New York city, Robert, Corey told me something after I left the mayor's office. And he said, he, he actually was very kind. And we were having a conversation is this is as I was leaving. And he said, he said, you know, Anytime there's public money involved, I just see my fundamental role as a journalist to shoot holes in the proposal from every angle. And I was like, man, I wish you'd told me that five years ago, you know, <laughs> because it's like, it's like, yeah, presuming, pre presuming the best intent, even when maybe others don't have the best intent, right? Even when they're not engaging intellectually, they don't care about the merits. They're just trying to not let you get a win. Okay. But presuming the best intent, and showing a level of transparency and honesty, um, it takes a lot of prep. It takes a lot of discipline, but um, it really, it really is worth it. And and you know, one of the things that has benefited me now in my role at the Indy Chamber is um, some of my own board members 
are people that I, by a project maybe I was working on the mayor's office was on was on opposite sides of the negotiating t- negotiating table with you know, and I and I saw colleagues and you did too. Let's be honest, they would be at the other on the other side of the negotiating table with someone and they would behave in a way that it would sever the relationship, right? That's um, right. And 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 I I learned through through observing others. I learned in making some mistakes that there's a way to advocate for your position, but uh, with a sense of respect for your adversary. And, and you, and you helped, you helped me a lot, a lot in that respect. You know what I mean? Just in the, here's what, here's what the opposition is trying to do. Here's their basic motivation here, your relationship with people like Ed Tracy, who is chairing the Marion County Democrats. You know what I mean? Um, well, just because we think it's the right thing to do, doesn't mean that it's the perfect thing to do. That's right. And those are entirely different things. That's right. And you, you have to understand that the other side, which you may disagree with, that doesn't mean they're wrong about everything. Mm-hmm. And when we were doing the utility deal, especially, uh, I would leak certain aspects of the deal to the media so they could get uh, covered. And then Democrat uh, bloggers, because that's what, the, what they were doing back then. Uh, but Democrat commentators would then comment on it, would would criticize it, would try to tear it apart. And I would bring it to you and go, look, I think that's a good point. Let's fix that. And you would say, yeah, that is a good point. You can learn a lot to aid your own cause by listening to people who are not necessarily aligned with your own cause. Yeah. And, and, you know, I did, and this, this is from, and I'm sure this rings true in military history too. I did when Jason Clough came in, you know, succeeding the brilliant Kariga Roush, the equally sure. brilliant Jason Clough comes in. I remember I was on my way out to go to the airport and work at the airport at that time. But I remember Jason came and presented me with a stressful situation in, in, involving leadership in the community. And somehow without really knowing what I was saying, I was like, don't worry about it. You make the first move and you make them respond to you. And I still believe that that's true. And that's where, that's where I think the creativity comes in that you can have on the public sector side. Now, of course, I could never act without the mayor's support, right? And I always I had to be acting, um, obviously, you know, with transparency and make sure within the boundaries of the laws and the procedures, that stuff is incredibly important. But too often I see young people get in the environment and they get frozen and they get paralyzed. And it makes me sad because there there's 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 so much opportunity to do good and have these great experiences you know employing your creativity and whether that's you know on one of these transactions or whether that's reimagining uh you know a project like you know cityway which you're very familiar with and we worked on uh you know it's uh there, there's just there's, there's too much opportunity in that environment and this and, it, and that holds true with my job at the chamber as well and and, and the opportunities presented um by working in government, working in politics. I haven't, it's been a while. I haven't spoken to a, a a class, a college class, but every time that I do, it's get involved in politics. I don't care how you vote, get involved. You get a chance to work in government, work in government. It's the best place to meet people. It's the best place to understand how things really work. But, but Michael is not just facts and figures and transactions and, and, and all these things. Our actual first conversation was, I remember, lengthy conversation was sitting with Brian Sullivan, our very close friend who we love, at the Starbucks at 15th oh and Capital. Gosh. And we uh, started talking a little bit about music. Yeah. And I know how important music is to you, both to listen and promote and play. Yeah. When did you start? playing a musical instrument and and what is the role that music plays in your life when i was when i was uh five piano lessons uh started playing for church in my small town piano and some um pipe organ when i was nine um accompanying choir through uh high school and college now i need to tell you robert so i never i don't know if it was the discipline or the ability I never crossed that threshold where I was good enough to have been like a a piano major or even like a music major at Northwestern, but I always played music in college and I was always in bands of varying quality. Some, some not very good, some, some okay. Um, Intensely interested in songwriting and arranging. And that's been a constant in my life. And, you know, in my twenties and thirties working for Mitch Daniels and Greg Ballard, I 
I kind of wouldn't really talk about it. It's not that I was embarrassed about it at all, but you know, when you're young, you want to, you want to seem serious and you want to seem focused. And I didn't, uh, you know, it'd be like, it'd be like having a colleague who does like theater or paints and stuff like that. And, you know, he or she doesn't really talk about it. I get into my mid to late thirties and I'm like, you know what, this is who I am. And the, the light bulb started going off because, um, I've always got music on. I always like to discover music and I always like to go back. And you and I have conversations a lot about kind of going back through artist catalogs that maybe we overlooked or, and I always enjoy those conversations. Go ahead. I'm just laughing because of the, every once in a while we send each other a picture of whatever's playing yeah. in our car. <laughs> I'm listening yeah. to this and you send and, me a picture. I'm listening to this. And your um, like perfect example, your um, for, for people who haven't listened to all the Le- uh, leaders and legends podcast, your interviews with Greg Renoff, who's written some great books about Van Halen, but his, my favorite one that I've read is about the producer, Ted Templeman and all the artists Ted Templeman works with. And, and, that's been great. So and we should give a shout out real quick uh, to our friend, Mark Allen, who used to be absolutely. the uh, music critic for the Indianapolis star. Uh, he's been on the podcast a few times. Uh, he has a podcast called the tapes archive where he has interviews with Phil Collins, Alex Van Halen, the REM, the list goes on and on. It's called the tapes archive yep. by Mark Allen. You want to listen to some great stories told by the musicians themselves. Listen to Mark's podcast. Absolutely. And so, it's kind of like Robert, I kind of see these parallels now that I either didn't see before or didn't want to admit. So it's like my role playing music is a lot like my role of who I am in my, in my job at the chamber and who I was for Ballard too. So I'm, um, I'm not a virtuoso pianist, but I'm kind of the guy who is really overseeing the arrangement of, you know, so it's like, so in my band, my, my, my uh, most successful band, uh, Chamber Music, which is an, an R&B band, uh, black and white members, star singer, Vanessa Renee, who's unbelievable. I mean, she's like Gladys Knight. She's unbelievable and really good musicians. It's like, so I'm in a way kind of the uh, organizer of the effort. I'm, I'm kind of overseeing the arrangement. I'm not the best player in that band. I, I'm a backing vocalist in that band. I sing lead on a few songs, but my point is, the piano for me is almost an, uh, an arranger's kind of instrument. You know, it's got bass, it's got treble, it's got high and it's got low and you can emulate all kinds of different sounds. And I really love synthesizers, as you know, for that reason, I, I'm a, definitely a synthesizer geek and the, the range of sounds. And so I'm always thinking about the arrangement, but the reality is to make great music, you always need different um, instruments and voices in your team and in your group, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's only been in the last five years that I've really started thinking about, okay, how is that sort of, um, you know, a metaphor for my life and my, my working life too, and really trying to integrate that. Um, I'm 45 years old. I've started writing original music. I've, I've written original music with collaborators for 20 years. I've started writing original music just for me just recently. That's kind of my new growth experience. Um, if anybody's hearing this, my, my band chamber music is going to play some of those compositions on uh, July 2nd in fountain square outside at the hi-fi we'll be at the jazz kitchen on August the 1st as well. If anybody's listening, but, um, millions been, of people are listening, Mike. That's millions right. That's right. as opposed to, as opposed to my podcast, which you were on, which my mother listens to and nobody else, but, um, but yeah, but I've really, I've, I, I get excited now more so about growing as a musician and then trying to be attentive into how that helps me in other parts of my life. And, you know, um, again, you have been more of an influence than, you know, on in terms of health and wellness, because, you know, I quit alcohol uh, almost uh, four and a half years ago, which has been transformative. Um, and I've prior, you, you're somebody who has obviously prioritized wellness and exercise for a long time. And I'm kind of a late comer to that game. But the more that I prioritize my health and my wellness, it just gives me more energy for music. You know what I mean? It's just, it helps. Um, and this is, you know, I mean, millions of people have experienced this. It helps me deal with difficult situations in my life, you know? So uh, go ahead. Well, that was the first leg of the three-legged stool yeah. I wanted to ask about with regard to Michael Huber and, and what makes him tick, what sustains him, yeah. what gives him inspiration. The second one is your significant devotion and involvement uh, with the Catholic Church. Yeah. I know how important it is to you. I, we've talked about Catholicism quite a bit. Yeah. You're a terrific Catholic and adherent to the faith. How does, how does the church 
sustain you and get you through the times? Cause you're under a lot of pressure most every day. Well, I, if you, you can choose to see it as pressure, right? And, I, and, and so that's one thing that I work on is try to, try to see it as opportunity and not pressure. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 I'm, it's probably a typical Catholic answer. I'm, I don't feel like I'm a great Catholic, but um, my faith is a huge part of my life. Um, and my um, commitment to health and sobriety has kind of put an exclamation point on that and, all, and also kind of made me realize how far I have to go. The, the reality is, um, uh, you know, my spiritual life helps me stay grounded in all the opportunities that I have been given, literally like handed to me. You know, you and I have a lot in common, like we didn't grow up with a tremendous amount of financial wealth, but I was always surrounded by all this family love and support, extended family love and support, which I, um, uh, I, I hope I didn't take for granted there are times, and this is one way where I've changed, there were times when you and I were working for Mayor Ballard and we'd be working on something that was getting a lot of media coverage and there was political pressure and I'd be like, oh, this is so much pressure. So, you know, you flip that around and it's like, no, I'm getting to have these great experiences that I probably wouldn't be able to have in most environments because Mayor Ballard is giving me this, this um, amount of trust, you know? And so I, it's, a, it's a daily, it's a day, and this is my, my spirituality and I have a lot of growing to do, it's a daily practice of trying to take my ego out of it and trying to be of service. And if I can take my ego out of it and show that how, and, and just use the tools in front of me to be of service, that self-imposed pressure reduces significantly and it looks like opportunity. Now I might, it's easy for me to talk that to actually walk the walk has got to be a part of a daily practice because I can easily get into my fear mode or my ego mode. The last leg of the stool is what can only be described as one of the most darling families I've ever seen. Talk to us uh, just a little bit about your wife, Helen. You, you mentioned how you met her. Um, she is uh, smart. And she is sassy and she is a sweetheart. Um, yeah. I mean, she, she is my, you know, serenity, you know what I mean? I mean, she's the, she's the reason that I get to do everything that we've talked about, you know, and she's not, it's um, I don't know what it would be like to have, you know, you have, sometimes you'll have two spouses who are really involved in politics. I don't know what that would be like. Some, some part of me thinks maybe that would be difficult. You know, she, she is someone who, could not be less interested in uh, local politics and things like that. She's a liberal Democrat who went to Berkeley undergrad and is very much of the Bay Area and yet has really embraced Indianapolis. Um, we have kind of opposing temperaments. You know, I'm, as you can probably tell, if you don't know me, can get very up and down in my energy level all the time. And she is very constant just in her um, kind of presence and in her love. And she's just a, she's just an amazing mom. And she's got a whole, you know, life and interests of her own that I'm just constantly learning from, you know, our thing, as you know, in the past 18 months, we um, not even in June, we bought an RV trailer, we were three months into COVID, just like, what are we, what are we even, what, what, how do we go out and visit people? And so we're on this adventure, we drove, we drove it everywhere last year, we drove it to California to see her parents uh, have a distance visit with their parents. We're driving it to the East Coast in a few weeks and uh, our three kids, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's obviously for anybody who's had kids, it's a lot of work. You've got to be totally committed to it, but it's just like, I, I, I look at, I look at any, um, any expectations that I would have had for my life at 18. And it's, it's so far beyond anything that I could have hoped for. And again, it's, and that's, that's my wife and my kids and the things I get to work on and the people I know, but that's got to be a daily practice because I can lose that perspective uh, very easily. The thing about Indianapolis though, and this is why I appreciate you doing this show because this impacts all three legs of the stool. It, it, when you, when you get a gift, you really want to give it back. You know what I mean? And, and Helen and I both feel like this, neither of us are from this community and it has given us so much just in, in the people that we've gotten to meet, present company included. So it really, I don't know, it does tap into something that really makes you, you know, we've received so much, it really, it really makes you want to give back. And this city deserves it in more ways than one because the opportunities presented and the people involved are just so amazing. 
and yeah. it, it's why people keep coming back here. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll, I've, you know, you're episode 21 of my podcast and I'm episode hundred and whatever of yours. So you've been at this for three years, but I do want to plug, you know, we got to turn the tables and have you reflect on a lot of these lessons that you've learned from interviewing, you know, fathers and mothers, of the city. And uh, I would, so I would highly recommend uh, my, my podcast with Robert Vane is dropping on, uh, on Friday. And I, I, I don't know, I've just been thinking a lot lately about, you know, what, what has Indianapolis really given me and given my family? And uh, it's a lot. Well, that's the last question I want to ask you before we go on to the five questions is talk a little bit, please, just for a minute about your podcast, why you decided to do one, the format and how much you're enjoying it. And I think like you, my, your first podcast was Greg Ballard and my first podcast was Greg Ballard. So I, um, I realized, uh, I, I, I hope to be working at the Indy chamber for a long time, but I won't be there forever. And I realized that what, what is it, what does it give me? Well, it gives me access to a, a very broad range of people across, um, uh, different, different businesses. Cause we're a business organization of 2000 members, but it also, it's allowed me to develop relationships with musicians and other people like that. So I decided, um, on my own time, I sat on this for like a year, Robert, as you know, on my own time on evenings and weekends, I'm going to have conversations, recorded conversations with people that I want to talk to. Um, that I, I, it's recorded, edited, produced music, everything by me. And, I finally decided to do that because I knew that if it were a product of the indie chamber, I'd probably have to make compromises. You know what I mean? Like you, sure. you've got, you own your business, you call the shots. I've got 2000 members. So if this were a property of the indie chamber, I'd have to, I'd have people ask me, well, can you interview this person, that person? I, I said, I told my staff, I'm like, I want to do this for me and just record these conversations for posterity. And I'm going to put no more thought into it than that. And it's been fantastic, as you and Chris know. I mean, it's a lot of work, but um, it's been great. It'll the the conversations like the one we're having today allow me for you know an hour or so to kind of get out of that operational mode, mm -hmm. and and kind of think, uh, you know, think bigger uh, and kind of look back. And yeah, so it's called Michael Loves Indy, and uh, episode twenty one featuring Robert Vane drops on Friday. We are talking to Indy Chamber President and CEO and my former colleague, Michael Huber. We work together in the Ballard Administration. We have reached the point in the Leaders and Legends podcast where everybody gets asked the same five questions. So are you ready, sir? I think so. What was your first job? Mowing lawns in Hillsboro, Illinois, door to door. What was your first concert? James Taylor. Uh, I was 15 years old. Thank you, uh, Mike Collins, for taking me. He was a few years older than me. Great, great first concert. Not Adam Collins. Not Mike Adam Collins. Collins. No, they're great. Adam, if it was Adam Collins, it would be a hip-hop concert for sure. I think that's probably pretty good. Yeah. Number three, if you could suggest any book for someone to read, which book would you choose? Okay, right now, so Cal Newport, who wrote... Um, you know, deep work and digital minimalism is such a thoughtful writer. And I, I, I found myself the other day recommending a book called So Good They Can't Ignore You to a younger colleague. So it's Cal Newport and it's called uh, So Good They Can't Ignore You. Number four, if you could witness any event in history, be there as it happens, which event would you choose? I thought I was going to be prepared for this, Robert, um, <laughs> witnessing any event. Um, I'm going to go with um, the, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, the St. Louis Cardinals, 1982, winning the World Series, Game 7. That's what I'm going to go with. First they thing that came to my mind. They beat the Brewers. Is that they right? Did. They the did. The Suds series. They beat, yeah, Harvey's Wall Bangers. Yep. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. My favorite. My That was my favorite baseball team. 82 Cardinals. Yep. The last question. If you could have dinner with anyone living today, two hours off the record, just to chat, whom would you choose? Stevie Wonder. No doubt. Got to see him, Robert. Man, I got to see him uh, November of 2016 um playing songs in the key of life uh, note for note and um he came out it was uh about 72 hours after amos brown died 
I was going to say that's right. And he he walked out, um, escorted by a couple of his backup singers, all the lights off except one spotlight. And he just comes out and everybody cheers. And he says, uh, tonight's performance is dedicated to the great community servant, Amos Brown, um, who died recently. Lights out, you know, several minutes of silence. Uh, but yeah, but his, just Stevie's whole approach to music and uh, just, I don't know. It tap right. It, it just, it taps into something um, just, you know, spiritual and, and uh, kind of otherworldly for me. Brilliance is always compelling. No, no doubt. matter, no matter what field it's in. No doubt. Yeah. Yeah. You have been listening to leaders and legends, a podcast presented by veteran strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by girl scouts of central Indiana, Garmond construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today has been Indy Chamber President and CEO Michael Huber. He's a good friend. He's a terrific family man. He's brilliant, and he's an absolutely amazing citizen. Thank you, Michael, for coming on. Robert, always great to be with you. Um, look forward to talking again soon. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Mm-hmm.